here is this whole process of service coordination um, that exists at the state level. It is um, part of the state infrastructure. Um, it's in the Ohio Revised Code that every county sh shall have a service coordination mechanism um, as a part of their Family and Children's First Council. And that service coordination mechanism gets implemented normally through a service coordination process. Um, and that process is one that is usually um, delivered through via a wraparound process, uh, but it's a bit modified. And what I wanna go over today are the key components of what is involved in the service coordination process. We are working at the state level right now to continue to define and um, well, define service coordination as it relates to high fidelity wraparound because there's a lot of confusion. Um, they're very similar in, in many ways and I'll, I'll talk about those similarities here, but there are some differences. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the why do we do this. Um, and I think ECHO really um, represents why we do this. There's a lot of youth and families with complex needs um, that present and, and to communities and communities in general may not know what to do and um, because of the complexity. Um, so they're asked to make a complex level of care decision for youth. Um, they're asked to manage risk and safety issues uh, that sometimes, depending on the, the level of risk comfort level of the community, uh, communities may more likely be to place a child somewhere because of what they view as a safety issue. And other counties who have a higher risk comfort level may keep them in the community with other supports and services. So really kind of getting a gauge of what your community is about, but also using the service coordination process to help manage that with the community. Um, I believe that no single system can manage the multiple needs of at-risk youth and, and their families alone. Um, I also believe that the more people you have involved in a child's life, uh, the more complex um, the needs and dynamics are, and that leads to systemic confusion about how we all help. Um, and because of all that, we need a process for facilitating um, plans across systems. Um, and we also need a, a process to make sure that all the planning is youth and family driven. I'm going to get into that. Um, and that there's a process for developing a consensus based decision. Okay, because many of our plans bubble up to the court level. Um, and judges and magistrates are left trying to make a decision with whatever information they're given. So the more information they're given, especially if it's from a community team that involves youth in the family um, that's already been, that, that have already met, and they're presenting a plan of, of success that can generate, it's easier for the magistrate to make a, um, a clinically informed, a community informed decision for that youth and family. Um, one of, because of, you know, well, this will become more evident as we talk today, but I want to talk about youth in custody as well. Um, and youth in custody have complex family systems. Um, they have multiple caretakers. They have multiple demands and mandates. Um, they have multiple allegiances. Um, whether they're living with their family or not, that doesn't mean they don't still love their family or want to be with their family. Um, they have multiple service providers with diffuse roles. Um, one of the di dynamics um, that I think is critically important is that youth in custody in, generally, in general have an unavailability of decision makers to them. Decisions happen more slowly uh, and they have a minimized voice. And so I really want to emphasize that point that the people that make decisions about them are less available to them and because of that, decisions happen much more slowly, which generates a whole lot of frustration on the youth part, which generate all kinds of behaviors, right? And so some of the reasons for behavior sometimes are system generated. 
I'm pausing because I want to emphasize that. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and keeping in mind that the youth may still desire to live with the family. So there's that whole dynamic of the system made a decision that the risk is so large that the child has to be somewhere else. In the youth's mind, that might not be the case. And maybe in the family's mind, that might not be the case. Um, so to emphasize again that there, are, there can be system-generated triggers, lack of control, <laughs> lack of immediacy of decisions, leads to youth frustration and initiation of escalation patterns. Um, so those are some of the dynamics I want to lay them out. Um, how we solve them is through community ownership of all of our youth, and we talk about that a lot, but that means that it's full participation of the community in the planning, and it means full participation in the youth and, of the youth and family in those meetings about them. And it also means that we're sharing community risk in planning for safety and success. Um, I often say that risk doesn't go away because we put the child somewhere else, okay? The risk still exists, it just went somewhere else. Um, is it possible to plan for safety successfully in a less restrictive environment uh, for that youth? Um, so, what are some of the benefits of service coordination? Um, well, it, it really helps develop a consensus-based plan um, it shares the burden, it shares the risk. Um, if you talk to magistrates and judges, they'll tell you, I just don't want my name in the paper for a bad decision. Well, let us share the bad name then, you know. Um, we came up with a community plan that we thought was thoughtful and had safety measures in it that hopefully make, uh, spreads um, the burden and shares that risk across the community, not just with the court system. Um, courts are much more likely to consider a uh, consensus-based plan. Um, they just want good information to base their decisions on. Um, brings people together that may have something different to offer than your system can provide. So that's why we want all the systems involved in the decision-making. And they can bring different resources, services, and supports. It's collectively, when we bring that together, there's much more power uh, to help youth and families be successful in building that plan. Um, and then we work toward common goals um, across child welfare, school, juvenile justice, to keep kids in, the, in their less restrictive family environment when safe and possible. Can I add? Yes, Patty would like to so add. So as we look at common goals, we add improved physical health. Since so many of our cases have the young people we're talking about can we add the physical health factor especially with dr white I, I think um that that um usually people say their criticism of my powerpoint so <laughs> no, no, after no, we're no. done <laughs> good point patty um Thanks. and i think one of the goals that we need to add to this uh, as i think this through a little bit is adding something about improving physical health as well <laughs> thank you sure. <laughs> Why isn't it moving forward? Sorry. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that Ohio has an infrastructure uh, for a planning process to happen in every county. Um, and there's a lot of variability between counties, um, mostly based on um, funding and resources they have to hire staff to do this. Um, and that's through their county service coordination mechanism. Um, service coordination may be implemented utilizing high quality wraparound approach. Um, and, and we're playing around with words here, folks, because you know when we use the word high fidelity, wraparound has a certain particular meaning. So we're using the words high quality. Um, and we want to increase the quality as, as we go with that. Um, I've included um, in, in, this, in the uh, slides the, the key aspects of what's in the Ohio Revised Code around this. I'm not going to review it other than say it's in the PowerPoint, that will be available to you. Uh, more about the why, um, and, and I had the privilege, really, and I think the word is privilege, to do service coordination in, in my county for five years. And one of the things that I found was most effective was that it helped level the playing field for the youth and the families that were you know, asking for help. Um, and when you enter a room of 
big people, you know, um, powerful people like child welfare, like the schools, um, like juvenile justice and probation and, and things like that. These are all folks that can mandate things um, to, make the, to, to make the youth and family do things. And, it, and there's a power differential as soon as they walk in the room. I think that one of the jobs of service coordination is to, to level the playing field and level the power differential so that mm -hmm. the, the voice of the youth and the family is heard and valued um, as equal. And, and that is an important thing, and it's not an easy thing either. I think one of the other things that I valued was it decreases system confusion. I thought you were doing that. No, I thought you were doing that. Um, and it generates out-of-the-box solutions to complex situations. Um, and as long as I see Marjorie shaking her head yes throughout the PowerPoint, I feel I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I thought a lot about this um, in terms of what does service coordination do? Uh, what's the outcome we're really looking for? And I, I think part of it is, you know, obviously always it's addressing safety. Um, the other outcome is it addresses youth and family rights um, and empowerment. Uh, we become system level advocates for the youth and family. And we want, and, and what I've also learned about service coordination is it works best when you have parent peer support involved, youth peer support when it's available, and the family's informal support system there. Okay. Um, this was all very essential. And I just want to point out something that, keep in mind from a family perspective, not only is the system quite powerful, the system can cause a lot of trauma. And what they can do is make very powerful decisions about what can happen to the family. I can take your children away. I can kick your kid out of my school. Um, I can um, put your child in jail, right? So when we think about, I can put you in jail. Think about all the powerful things the system can do. I can place your child somewhere. Um, it really is important that we have strong system advocacy for those youth and families. Um, system navigation is another thing. Um, if I were to ask everybody uh, on our group today, what's the difference between a counselor, social worker, marriage and family therapist, QMHS, um, psychosocial rehab, um, therapeutic behavioral support provider, your eyes would glaze over. Can you imagine what the family is feeling? Um, let alone all of the rules at the school or at the court, right? So does the family understand the rules and mandates of each system that their child is involved in? Do they know how to ask for the help that they need? Um, and what additional strategies would be useful to them? So we want to help the family learn how to navigate uh, and understand the systems. <clears throat> uh, as part of service coordination, we're always looking at least restrictive and most normative planning. Um, we should always be thinking about what exists in that residential treatment center that we could put in the home. What's different there? What are you expecting from that thing um, that's outside of your home? And can we make that happen inside of the home and in the environment? Um, the other thing that service coordination does, especially in Ohio, is it gives you access to system level decision makers. Okay, so there's usually levels of, you get the process and then that can be up leveled to um, a decision making group at your local FCFC um, that has access to resources and ability to make uh, system level decisions. Uh, when I unpack the service coordination process itself, there's an engagement function um, and it's engagement. Um, did the facilitator identify, reach out to, and engage with the entire family and network of supports? So we're talking about broadening out always um, the breadth of supports that's available to a family. Um, are we assisting the system in providing an understand and system providers in understanding the family differently uh, to build more effective partnerships, um, punctuating and translating youth and family strengths, um, and creating an appreciative perspective. The families are doing the best they can given their current life circumstances. 
in their journey. So how do we as facilitators of a service coordination <coughs> planning process um, assist other providers in the room in understanding the family differently? Okay, that's another role that we have. Um, how do we support in a meeting the family's lead in driving the process? Are we doing family check-ins throughout the meeting? So we're saying to them, hey, is that okay with you? They made a suggestion over here. How does that work? So that we're always leveling the playing field through how we facilitate. Um, do we honor the family's expertise and culture throughout the meeting? And part of the engagement function for me is providing hope. How do we foster the possibility of hope and a positive future um, for that family? And another reason why we want family peer support to be in the room because they probably have gone through the journey, experienced the pain and you know, the frustration of the system, and maybe come out at the other end and can tell another story and reassure the family that there is hope. Another function of service coordination is to do an assessment. Um, and it looks a little different when, it, when we talk about service coordination. So we're looking about strengths and needs of the family. Um, but I added a few extra before today, and I, I, I also think that we assess supports. I think we assess barriers to those um, supports, and we do it across life domains. So that's usually how the service coordination mechanism, the service coordination meetings are organized. So we're walking through strengths and needs through different life domains of that human family. Uh, another function of uh, service coordination is to develop resource supports and accommodations. So I think this is really one of the key things that we work on. Um, what are the resources the family has and doesn't have? Um, when we talk about Maslow, we have to talk about are their basic needs met? Um, and if not, are the, you know, is that getting in the way of this family meeting the rest of the needs of that youth and family? We know that poverty is very impactful. Have we worked with developing realistic expectations that maximize success for that youth and family? Realistic expectations. Um, and developing accommodations for that youth in all of their environments that they, they have to function in. Does the youth and family have the skills to do what we're asking them to do? Do we need to work on a, you know, um, inserting that into the plan? And does the youth and family have opportunities for contribution and participation. So when I'm running a meeting, I'm thinking about all of these things um, that can help the youth and family be successful. And then there's an organizational function in a service coordination meeting. Is our good alignment um, and fit of services and supports? Do the current services and supports um, meet the family's needs? Um, and some of these, by the way, come from um, some um, state level coaching meetings that we have and, and Neil Brown um, offering uh, these up. Um, are they um, timely enough? I mean, do we have the right services now if the family needs something now? Uh, we're developing services of the state mobile response uh, stabilization to help get services in more timely fashion to families. Um, what about the diversity and breadth of supports and connections? Are the supports matched to the strengths and interests of the youth and family? Um, are we offering supports to the entire family, right? Because family, the parents need supports as well. The grandparents need supports as well. Um, are we proactively planning for respite if they need a pregnancy related? Um, and how well is the family connected to the community itself and the community partners? So when I think about connections, it's much broader than just uh, for the kid or we need respite. And there's a lot of connections that need to be made. Um, we also look at organizing roles and responsibilities. So at the end, we come up with a plan and responsibilities clearly assigned um, with follow-up. Um, we look at service overload. Um, is it the right amount of service and supports for this family? Um, we tend to overload the family with services and supports and burden. It creates a burden. Um, and with burden comes a shutdown. And then we hold them accountable for giving them too much to do. And when they don't do it, you know, we say, well, they, they didn't do it. Rather than looking at what we just assigned, right? So the standard JFS plan in any state includes family will go um, 
the parents will receive substance abuse assessment. And if so indicated, they'll get substance abuse counseling. We're going to do an assessment for psychiatric needs of the child. Oh, and while we're at it, we'll do that for the family as well. Um, you've got to go to parenting classes. Uh, you've got to get good housing and you've got to get a job. And that's where that starts, right? And so if you're a family hearing all of those things, it just feels really heavy. So is it the right amount that is supportive to the family and we give the family supports in achieving the plan? Um, and then addressing access and barriers. So um, these are all the kinds of things that we're thinking about as we facilitate a meeting to help the families be more successful. Um, and this is the, we've used this slide before, but for me, this is what it's all about. There's a process for each youth and family that has complex needs that may include support, services, and resources. And then how do we coordinate all of that? And, and, and I got through this um, in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>